Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I'm Janet Jacobson, and I'm the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And I. <laughs> And I want to welcome you all to Activism and the Academy, celebrating 40 years of feminist scholarship and action. And we are indeed here for a celebration. The Barnard Center for Research on Women, known locally as the Barnard Women's Center, was founded in 1971. And we are here to celebrate the dedication, the accomplishments, and even the controversies that have been part of the center and the college since that moment when a dedicated group of faculty members, alumni, and students came together to found the very first research center focused on women at an institution of higher education in the United States. So we are most certainly here to celebrate the vision of the initial group of people who established the Women's Center but we are also here to continue the project that they began. We want to focus on the centerpiece of the vision that they created, the connection between scholarship and action, a topic that is absolutely crucial in the current moment, when feminist ideas and feminist action could not be more important. So for the next two days, even as we celebrate the past, we will be mostly focused on the present and the future as we explore what we can do to ensure, in the words of the original charter of the center, that women live and work in dignity, autonomy, and equality. I will return to the question of our current conversations in a moment, but first, just a few more words about the past that we're here to celebrate. Therefore, there are, for example, many, many people who I need to thank for getting us to this point. Now, I promise not to go through the full 40 years of thank yous. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, but I do want to begin, and thank you all for coming today. It's very exciting to see so many people here. Um, I do want to begin by thanking the visionary group of people who were the founders, um, the cohort that founded the center in 1971. Um, faculty members Annette Baxter, Patricia Graham, and Catherine Stimson. And Catherine Stimson also served as the first acting director of the center. Two, <laughs> two alumni trustees, Eleanor Elliott, who as many of you know, procured the first gift from the Helen Rogers Reed estate to establish the center, um, and Iola Haverstock, and then two administrators, Barbara Hertz and Jane Gould. Um, Jane Gould became the first permanent director of the center, and as she reports in her book, Juggling, a Memoir of Work, Family, and Feminism, the group met for over a year about the importance of creating a center focused on women that could respond to feminism beyond Barnard's gates and embody feminism at the college. These conversations were expansive, including a wide range of activities from providing a place for women's scholarship to supporting feminist counseling for Barnard students to contributing to the burgeoning feminist movement that was beyond Barnard's gates. And as I just learned a few years ago when we did a remembrance in honor of Jane Gould, the conversations were also contentious, setting up a tradition that we've tried to hold to. <laughs> um, they were particularly apparently contentious over whether the center would be f focused on and run by students or whether it would be um, run by faculty. Um, and I think, I like to think that we've now reached a good balance, and you'll see all of our Barnard students around with the Dare to Say the F Word um, t-shirts. Um, and Janet Axelrod, class of 1973, who was one of the students participating in those early discussions, will provide her perspective on the early days at um, the reception this afternoon in honor of our BCRW alumni. Um, there will also be an open mic time at the reception, um, and so for those of you who want to share the, your memories, there will be a sign-up sheet at the welcome table when you come into the room. Um, and then Suzanne Vega, class of 1981 and a BCRW student, uh, will be playing at the reception, so please stick around um, for that this afternoon. From those early years, the center has gone through successive waves of activity, and it's that succession of continuing renewal that has made the center so strong. And I would like to thank the directors of the center who followed on um, the initial visionaries and who built the project into something that we can now celebrate. 
Um, both Tema Kaplan, um, who is now professor of history and women's and gender studies at Rutgers University, and Leslie Kalman, now executive director of the Montner Project, the National Lesbian Health Over Organization, have gener generously come back to share their wisdom and to moderate panels at the conference um, and to be able to share with us the important work that they did in their years here at the center. I will also note that Leslie, who is a Barnard alum, has for the last 20 years taught an invariably popular center course called Women's Culture and Women's Lives, despite the fact that she herself now lives in Washington, D.C. Um, the age range in this course is from about uh, 20 to about 90, and it's a very exciting undertaking, and we thank her for it. I also want to thank all of the conference participants. We welcome people from all over the United States and different parts of the world, including Mexico, India, Northern Africa, and South Africa. Unfortunately, I must announce that Christine Karumba, who was to be on the last panel, the Building Rebuilding Societies panel, and is from the Democratic Republic of Congo, was, is unable to join us because the State Department refused to offer her a visa. Stating, and this was in an email to our acting director, Elizabeth Costelli, that they needed more evidence that she had ties to the Democratic Republic of Congo um, and would return to her home country. Apparently, being an activist dedicated to ending violence in one's home country <laughs> is not a sufficient tie to one's home. We have lodged our complaint with the State Department, um, and um, uh, fortunately, Jane Bennett, who is the director of the African Gender Institute, has agreed to take Christine's place. But one of the things that we will speak about throughout the course of this conference is how best to facilitate transnational and cross-border collaborations and how to face the challenges that all collaborations present. We are very pleased to have new media collaborators for this particular conference. Both Feministing and the Women's Media Center are media par partners for the event, and they will be live tweeting the conference. There is a live stream of the Twitter feed using the hashtag VCRW40 on the conference website. So all of you can participate in the conversation if you want. And we want to thank Sonal Baines for facilitating our work with these organizations, and we look forward to continuing to build the collaborations into the future. In my last round of thank yous before returning to the conversations, I want to thank those who have made this particular conference possible. First of all, I have to thank the wonderful, incredible staff of the Barnard Center for Research on Women with whom I am so fortunate to work. I'll be happy to tell you stories about all of them at the reception, although not at the open mic time. Um, they are Catherine Sammy, Lucy Trainer, Hope Dector, and Pam Phillips, and our fabulous student research assistants for this year. Frida Begum, Narane Bornutian, Zaina Giles, Shilpa Guha, Lu Yang Lu, Hallie McPherson, Lulu Michael Michelson, Emily Segura, Ali Salas, Dina Tyson, Eva Valencourt, as well as Vaidehi Josie, class of 2011, who was Shilpa Gupa, Guha, worked at the center for most of the summer and contributed greatly to the advance work for the conference. Finally, special thanks go to our colleague Elizabeth Costelli, who is serving as the acting director of BCRW this year while I am on leave, and who took over this particular event with her usual elegance. I'm absolutely thrilled that so many of you are here this morning and have registered for the conference. And while I'm sure that much of it is love for the Barnard Women's Center, um, as much as you may love us, I also sense an urgency in the number of you who are here today. I take it as a sign that the conversation in which we'll all participate over the next two days um, is part of what seems to be a growing sense of urgency that something needs to be done on behalf of feminism and social justice today. An urgency that is similar to but also different from the urgency that led to the founding of the center 40 years ago. In 1971, there was a growing feminist movement that was very visible here in New York City, as even trustees of the college like Ellie Elliott were participating in feminist marches down Fifth Avenue. The movement was also widespread. In the fall of 1971, people were working to free Angela Davis, and feminist journals were being published around the world. We have a number of these journals from the 1970s in our library collection here at the center, including the Asian Journal of Women's Studies, the European Journal of Women's Studies, Women in China, and the International Women's Network newsletter. Transnationalism is not a new thing. Now, in 2011, we find ourselves in a somewhat different situation. With feminism having been declared dead in the mainstream media any number of times in the intervening decades, and yet here you all are today. 
And importantly, although we've been told that if feminism itself isn't dead, then young people aren't interested, we have a number of young women speakers on the panels, and the online, online media world is populated with a breadth of young feminists who blog, tweet, and pursue feminist journalism online. But these are also dire times. And so although it's quite clear that feminism is alive and well, and perhaps most importantly, relevant today, the sense of urgency that we feel may be motivated as much by the challenges that our world is facing as by the excitement of a growing movement. We have a transnational economic crisis, wars in any number of areas in the world, many of them pursued and prosecuted by the government of the United States, and a building environmental crisis. Many forms of feminist justice, including reproductive justice, sexual health, and women's economic security are under attack. Several of the panels over the next few days will touch on these and other pressing issues. But these are also times when there are glimmers of new and exciting possibilities for social change and social movement. For new kinds of feminism to conjoin with more established forms. And I think that these new possibilities will be the focus of our conversation over much of the next two days. What I see in your presence here and in other outbursts of resistance over the past week and the past several months is desire as our most recent report in the New Feminist Solutions series says, which was with our collaborative partner, Queers for Economic Justice, a desire for change, for something new, including for new ways of making social change. And in order to pursue these possibilities and realize some of our desires, we need at least two things, thought and action. For the last 40 years, the Barnes Women's Center has served as a bridge between academic feminism and public activism, helping to disseminate the ideas produced by activists, connect the scholarship produced at colleges and universities to organizations who might make use of it, and construct new possibilities for action through collaboration. In other words, we're here today to talk about what all of us can do now, in this moment, to make the next 40 years different from the last four decades. Two, for example, cut down on the number of times that individuals choose violence within intimate relationships and to cut down on the number of times that the US government or any government chooses military conflict as a way to resolve problems. Even as we're committed to action and effectiveness at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, we reject the idea that what goes on at colleges and universities is merely academic. We believe that the work of scholarship, the production of knowledge, whether the study of social relations and systems, or the analysis of texts and rhetoric, or the scientific exploration of the natural world, all of this scholarship is important to the work of act activism and crucial to social change. And we believe that the power and excitement of scholarship is actually central to creating strong social movements, that ideas are exciting, innovative, even sexy. Some of the ideas that have been created, discussed, and argued over at the Women's Center can be read from the titles of our annual scholar and feminist conferences, like The Future of Difference in 1979, and of course, Toward, the Pol Toward a Politics of Sexuality in 1982. Presciently, they addressed the question of technology in 1983 and women in the 21st century in 1987. Women as change makers building and using political power in 1993 and women work and family in 1994, all topics that remain important today. Thinking, thinking about feminism, thinking about social justice is as important, we would argue, as marching because we must know what we're marching for. Not that the thoughts pursued in these conferences weren't controversial, whether about sex, war, or the future of difference, particularly of differences among women along lines of race, class, nation, gender identity, religion, physical activity. In fact, often it was their controversial nature that made them exciting and powerful and provided them with the breadth of circulation to make an impact on the world. But I think the real genius of the Barnard Center for Research on Women isn't just the prescient forward-looking aspect of the ideas that we've debated, fought over, carried out into the world, and acted upon. The real genius is in bringing thought and action together. Through decades of conferences like, the ones that, like this one, that includes scholars, artists, activists, and writers, bloggers, and producers of new media. 
and also through active collaboration between scholars and feminists in the project of producing knowledge and taking action. So over the next few days, you'll hear about activism on campus and writing by activists. You'll hear from keynote speakers who have been both academics and activists in Latin America and Africa. And you'll also hear plenary panels on collaborations between activists and academics here in New York City and globally. As you participate in the conversations generated at these panels, and join us, I hope, at the reception this afternoon in celebrating the students, now alumni of the college, who have made these last 40 years possible. I hope that you are energized by your participation, and I ask that you don't stop here in this room. We here at the Women's Center have started to think about the next 40 years of feminist scholarship and action, and we are launching new projects that are described in the newsletter in your packets, including a set of transnational collaborations, in, uh, starting with the African Institute the African Gender Institute, and a new program of faculty fellows begun with our good colleagues from Africana Studies and English, Kim F. Hall and Yvette Christiansa, and more new projects to come next year. And we're thinking about both the immediate future and the upcoming decades. I would ask that you do the same. At the end of the conference, I hope you go home exhilarated and not too exhausted, excited and engaged, and ready to take action. 10 years ago, in the fall of 2001, our first planned speaker was Sister Helen Prejean, author of Dead Man Walking and Anti-Death Penalty Activist. She came to campus on September 13, 2001. Needless to say, the campus was still in shock in many ways, but I couldn't have imagined a more perfect speaker to address the questions of violence and response that were foremost in everyone's minds here in New York. The first question after her talk came from a student who said that she was overwhelmed. What was she to do? The violence of the attacks and then the sense that violence might also be the response seemed too big for her to address. Helen Prejean's answer was straightforward. Find one thing, do that, and see where it leads. She herself, she said, hadn't intended to become an activist against the death penalty to write a best-selling book or to have that book made into a movie. She had simply written a letter to a death row inmate who she was told was unlikely to write back. But write back he did, and in her relationship to that individual, a movement, participation in a movement grew. So as we look to the future, I would ask that as you go through the next two days, each of you listen for the one thing that you might do, the idea you might develop, the collaboration you might build, the action you might take. Just one, see where it leads. <laughs>